The pentose phosphate pathway consists of two different phases. We have the oxidative and the non-oxidative phase. Now previously we focused on the oxidative phase and we saw that in the oxidative phase, the cells of our body transform a single glucose 6-phosphate molecule into two NADPH molecules and one ribose 5-phosphate sugar molecule. Now what do our cells use these two different molecules for? So as we discussed previously, the NADPH molecules are very important reducing agents that exist inside our cells because the cells actually use these molecules to help generate many other biological molecules. So things like fatty acid molecules, cholesterol molecules, nucleotide molecules, neurotransmitters, all these things require NADPH molecules. In addition, the cells also use the NADPH molecules to help detoxify many different different types of toxic agents that exist inside our cells. Now, what about the ribose 5-phosphate molecule? Well, the cells of, that, of, of our body use the ribose 5-phosphate to help generate nucleotide-based biological molecules. So, any time the, mo anytime the molecule contains a nucleotide, that means it requires ribose 5-phosphate. So, things like nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA, ATP molecules, NADH molecules, FAD molecules, as well as coenzyme A molecules, all these different things require ribose by phosphate. Now, as it turns out, the majority of the cells of our body, most of the time, actually require the NADPH much more than they need the ribose 5-phosphate molecule. And so what our cells actually do is, they take the ribose 5-phosphate that is produced via the oxidative phase, and they transform that into glycolytic intermediates. Why? Well, because these glycolytic intermediates can now be transformed transform into glucose 6-phosphate molecules and these glucose 6-phosphate can undergo the oxidative phase to produce even more NADPH molecules. And it turns out that this process here, the transformation of the ribose 5-phosphate into these glycolytic intermediates is the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. So, once again, when the cells need NADPH much more than ribose 5-phosphate molecules, the cells can actually transform this pentose sugar, the ribose 5-phosphate, into specific glycolytic intermediates via the non-oxidative phase. So we have the oxidative phase and the non-oxidative phase, and this constitutes the pentose phosphate pathway. Now, the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway can be broken down into four processes. So we have process one, process two, process three, and process four. So let's begin by focusing on process one. Now, in process one, we actually have two steps. In the first step, we want to take the ribose 5-phosphate molecule and transform it into an isomer version, ribulose 5-phosphate. And this is actually the same reaction that we discussed in the previous lecture, except it's, re it's in reverse. And so we have the same enzyme as we discussed previously, phosphopentose isomerase that catalyzes this reaction. Now, once we form the ribulose 5-phosphate, it then undergoes a second reaction, which is catalyzed by phosphopentose epimerase. And so what this does is, it transforms the ribulose 5-phosphate into the xylulose 5-phosphate. And the only difference between these two molecules is the stereochemistry of the third carbon. So this carbon here and this carbon here, they have a different stereochemistry. Now, why do we need this specific stereochemistry? Why can we use this? Well, because the enzyme in the second process of this pathway basically uses only this type of stereochemistry and not this type of stereochemistry. So we need to form the xylulose as a result of this trans ketolase that we'll talk about in just a moment.
So ultimately in process one, we want to transform ribo uh, ribose 5-phosphate into a xylulose 5-phosphate. And notice we begin with two of them. So we have two of these intermediates and we form two of these xylulose 5-phosphate products. Now, one of these xylulose molecules is used in step two, and the other one is used in step four, as we'll see in just a moment. So let's move on to step num or process two of the pentose phosphate pathway, specifically the non-oxidative phase of this pathway. So we take one of these xylulose 5-phosphate molecules and we take another ribose 5-phosphate molecule. So, so far we actually used three ribose 5-phosphate. So two were used here and now this, the, the third one we're using in this particular step. So we have the enzyme transketolase, which actually requires a cofactor we call thiamine pyrophosphate. And we'll talk about the mechanism of this enzyme and what this actually does in the next lecture. But basically what the transketolase actually does, it takes a two carbon group from the xylulose, it takes this entire section, places it onto the ribose. So notice both of these are pentose sugars, five carbon sugars. And when we transfer this section onto this molecule, we basically form, we extend that sugar by two carbons and we form a seven carbon sugar known as cetoheptulose 7-phosphate. Now, if we take away these two carbons from the xylulose, we essentially form a triose, a three carbon sugar, and that three carbon sugar is known as glyceraldehyde, 3-phosphate. So the products of step 2, reaction 2 of this particular oxidative phase is the cetoheptulose 7-phosphate and the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and is catalyzed by the transketolase. Now in process 3 of the, uh, of the non-oxidative phase, we now take these two products and these two products will act as reactants in process three. Now the enzyme in this particular case will be different. The enzyme here is transaldolase. And what transaldolase does is it takes this entire three carbon section here and transfers it onto this carbon here. And so we transform this molecule into urethrose four phosphate. So we take off three carbons. And so this is a four carbon sugar. And then we place the three carbons onto this molecule. So we form a six carbon sugar, the fructose six phosphate. And this fructose 6-phosphate is one of these glycolytic intermediate products. So this is actually the final product or one of the final products in the non-oxidative phase. Now, what we want to do in the final step in the final process is we want to take the urethrose 4-phosphate produced in process 3 and we want to take the second xylulose 5-phosphate that we still have left over from process one. Remember, we only used one of the two xylulose molecules that we produced in step one, in process one. So we use this one right here, and now we use the second one in this process four. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes the process four is the same enzyme that we used here. And so it's no surprise that this same enzyme uses the same substrate molecule. And what it does is, just like in this case, it took off this two carbon component from the xylulose and placed it onto the ribose. In this case, it once again takes off this two carbon component and places it onto this sugar molecule here. And so we extend this four carbon sugar by two and we form a six carbon sugar we call fructose 6-phosphate, which is once again a glycolytic intermediate molecule. And when we cut this one by two carbons, we form the three carbon triose molecule known as GAP, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And remember that GAP, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, is also a glycolytic intermediate. So we see that if we sum up all these four processes, this is the net reaction that we actually get. So we have to input 
three ribose phos, three ribose phosphate molecules. So two in this step, two in this process, and one in this process, and we essentially get back two fructose 6-phosphate molecules and a single glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And so now these are the glycolytic intermediates that can be transformed into glucose 6-phosphate and that glucose 6-phosphate can undergo the oxidative phase to form even more NADPH molecules. So when the cell actually needs the NADPH much more then it actually needs the ribose 5-phosphate, we undergo the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway to help us generate even more of these NADPH molecules. On top of that, what the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway allows us to do is it allows us to actually ingest ribose sugars into our body because via this particular pathway, we can actually break down the ribose sugar into glycolytic intermediates and then those intermediates can be used via glycolysis to actually generate high energy ATP molecules. So we see that the link between glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway is the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway.